right, my name is Chris Bailey. I'm the Acting Chief of Police for the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, I'm going to uh, read a statement of the facts tonight, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. So uh, just to make sure I don't miss anything, I'm going to be looking down here at the, at the notes that I have. First of all, I'm thankful that there were no uh, officers injured in this incident. Earlier today, just before 5.30 p.m., Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department officers with the East District Violence Reduction Team were attempting to locate a 48-year-old 40, male who was wanted on a warrant for possession of a firearm by a serious violent felon, criminal recklessness, pointing a firearm, and invasion of privacy. The warrant was issued as a result of investig an investigation from earlier in January where the suspect reportedly or allegedly fired shots at known individuals at a residence near 16th Street and Arlington Avenue. Tonight, officers observed the wanted subject get into a vehicle on the passenger side. Officers conducted a high-risk traffic stop in the 2600 block of Brookside Parkway North Drive using multiple fully marked police vehicles. A high-risk traffic stop is commonly referred to as a felony stop where officers use distance, do not approach the vehicle, and use verbal commands from, their, from, the, from the, uh, the cover of their police vehicles, uh, using them as barriers and ordering the people inside the car out one at a time. An officer was using uh, their PA system to order uh, the persons out of the car and within seconds, the suspect exited the vehicle on the passenger side with a handgun. We preliminarily believe, and detectives believe, that the suspect fired at officers first. The officers returned fire from the department-issued firearms, resulting in the suspect being hit by gunfire. The adult male uh, driver complied with the officer's directions and was taken into custody unharmed and without incident. Officers provided the suspect with medical attention and the Indianapolis Emergency Medical Services uh, IEMS transported the suspect to Eskenazi Hospital in critical condition where he passed away a short time later. No officers or uninvolved citizens were injured during this incident. Detectives have located a firearm next to the suspect. Uh, one police car was struck with multiple bullets. Officers were equipped with body-worn cameras, which were activated and running during this, during this incident. The Indianapolis Marion County Forensic Services Agency was on scene to collect all evidence for this investigation. The Marion County Coroner's Office will be assisting and will determine the exact manner and cause of death. They will release the decedent's name after proper notification to next of, next of kin has been made. And detectives are confident there is no ongoing threat to the community and there are no outstanding suspects. The IMPD Critical Incident Response Team is conducting the criminal, criminal investigation. A separate and parallel administrative investigation will be conducted by the IMPD Internal Affairs uh, Branch. Uh, the officers who fired their weapons are placed on administrative leave as a standard protocol in situations where they use deadly force. The officer, police officer support team was also on scene in the IMPD Chaplain's Office and Victim Assistance uh, to provide uh, you know, assistance to the other involved person and to the officers that are here on the scene. Officers were doing what we asked them to do tonight, and we're thankful that no, no officers were injured as a result of this incident. How many of them are on administrative leave? There were three officers who fired their weapons. This seems to be a scenario that's happened a lot lately where this investigative team is out looking for people wanted on these felony warrants, and it ends with them usually firing at the police officers. Um, are, is this these guns on the streets becoming a problem that you guys are uh, concerned about? I think that uh, the amount of weapons in the hands of the people who are not allowed to have them is a significant problem, not only for our community, but communities across the country. And we've seen this play uh, replayed over and over again. Uh, our community's in jeopardy. Here we have an individual who allegedly, uh, who we believe, fired shots at another one of our neighbors just a couple weeks ago. Our officers are doing exactly what we want them to do. They're being focused in their approach and going after that small number of people uh, that are responsible for the violence in our community. Uh, I think that's what our community wants us to do. Uh, and, you know, the choice made tonight by the individual to fire their weapon at the officer, uh, obviously we wish, we, wish, we wish he had not made that decision. 
We wish we had, he had complied like the driver did in that car uh, and that he had went to jail uh, for uh, the, the reason he had, he had the warrant. He was a serious violent felon, which means he, has, he had prior convictions for felonies. It's my understanding he was convicted of murder in 1997, uh, and that's why he was a serious violent felon. And he was not allowed to have the weapon, period. He was not a, he was not a proper person under state law or federal law uh, to have a weapon. Uh, that's why I'm thankful that our ATF partners are here. They provide quick traces of the weapons uh, that we encounter in these particular situations so that we can find out how individuals who are not legally allowed to purchase weapons or possess weapons find, uh, find a way to put them in their hands and use them against our neighbors. Do you think there needs to be some sort of reform when it comes to that? Well, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the, the politics of, of Second Amendment or anything like that, but we have a serious problem. Uh, in, in urban and large communities uh, where uh, handguns are destroying lives uh, and uh, they're being used against neighbors and they're being used by people who aren't supposed to have them. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the solution is to that necessarily. These guns are finding their way into people's hands by uh, illegal means of either intentionally being purchased from them by people who know that person's not supposed to have them. They're being, they're, they're being stolen from cars because uh, gun owners who may be proper persons are not responsible with, with, with uh, safe storage and making sure that their weapons are not able to be, to, to, to be stolen and fallen in hands. They're being stolen from burglaries and, 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 and they're being passed around uh, in neighborhoods to be used over and over again. How important was it to do that felony stop as opposed to a regular Yeah, stop? and we, we talk all the time about time, distance, barriers, communication, uh, additional resources. We knew we have an ind individual that was potentially armed. The officers knew that. They, that's why they were focused on him today. And so they gave themselves an opportunity. They gave him an opportunity uh, to step out of the car, follow the commands, and be arrested. Uh, the officers also gave themselves an opportunity to make sure that they're safe and that they're using those things that we talk about, the de-escalation things that we're saying. 99% of the time our officers are doing exactly what they're trained and exactly what our policies say to do. And, you know, uh, I, am, I am proud of what this department has done over the last four years, especially under previous Chief Taylor's uh, leadership. Uh, the policy that our, our, our training is top notch and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look for ways that we as a police department can mit mitigate uh, these type of encounters. We don't want them to happen. These three fine officers tonight did not want this to happen. Their families did not want this to happen. Uh, and, and so we'll still look at ways that things that we can control as the, as the police department, as police officers, to lower the risk and mitigate these situations. But at the end of the day, our officers respond to a lot of times to the, to the actions of the, of, of, of the people we have no control over. Can you speak to how often these types of incidents occur relative to the number of arrests and encounters that officers have with citizens? Yeah, I mean, I think that there was over 700,000 uh, dispatch runs last year. Uh, deadly force uses account for, uh, you know, I'm going to get the number a little bit wrong, but the PIO office can follow up and correct me, but 0.007% uh, of the time during these encounters. So it's a very rare occurrence. We don't want it to occur ever, ever. I want to be clear about that. No officer leaves their house with the intention of using force on someone that causes that person to lose their life. Uh, these, these are servants. These are guardians. They swore to protect the Constitution of the state of Indiana and the Constitution of the United States. They are doing that, but they also have a right to go home to, to their families. And my plea is put the guns down. If you do not have a right to have it, Put the guns down and please, please, when an officer tells you to do something, the street is not the time to litigate that, or whether or not it's the right thing or the officer's doing the right. That's not the place. Do what you're asked to do so that everyone, everyone goes home safe. That's what we want. No one wants this night. I don't want this, this, this man uh, at the coroner's office tonight. These officers don't. We don't want this to happen. So I'm begging you. Let's change this together. We can do it. This is avoidable. Let's do it. We have the ability. Did this individual immediately just get out of the car, the passenger side, start firing, or did he? The, did he the, quick, the quick review of the body-worn camera that I saw, the traffic, this traffic stop occurred 
the announcement started and it was it was seconds uh, as he got out of the car. There wasn't the officers didn't rush up to the car. They 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 were doing what I said they were doing. The 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 high risk stop using time, distance, and barriers, communication, and the individual jumped out of the car on the passenger side fairly quickly after the announcements on the PA started, and that's when you can hear the shots on the body on camera. What can, what, go through, what can go through an officer's mind when they're in a situation where they know they have to bring in someone who's possibly armed and dangerous like this? Well, you know, I, ca I can't speak for the mindset. I, I, I've never uh, been in a situation where I've had to use my weapon on a, on a, on a human being, so I can't speak to, to the feelings that they have. We, we do our best to train and, and use stress inoculation so that the officers have the ability to, to, to fight through stress and, and uh, adrenaline dumps and things like that. But what their mindset is, I mean, I can't, I can't speak to that. Thank you.